thank you everyone for coming. Um, this session is This Code Stinks. We have all seen this code before. My name is Larry Garfield. Um, you may know me as Krell uh, online in most venues. Uh, I'm, among other things, a member of the Drupal Association Board of Directors. Uh, for Drupal 8, I'm working on the Web Services and Context core initiative. So we're re rewriting about half of Drupal, so small project. Um, I was the co-author for Drupal 7 module development along with five other people, so I only did a little bit there. Um, and uh, around the office at Palantir, I am well known as a Nerf gunslinger. So don't get, cr you know, don't get cross with me, I'll shoot you. Um, code smells. That's what we're talking about here. What is a code smell? A code smell is not a bug. A code smell is an indication of something in code that might be a bug. There are ways to help you find if you're doing something wrong in your code before you actually run into a problem. <clears throat> um, determining what is and is not a code smell is often a subjective judgment and will often vary by language, developer, and development methodology. That is, you know, the guideline for, you know, there, there might be a bug at some point. These are not rules, they're more like guidelines. Uh, so what we're gonna do here is go through a couple of common problems, a couple of common warning signs that you can look for both in your own code and in code that you're reviewing from someone else. Who here has written code before at some point in some language? That's what I thought. Who has reviewed a patch on Drupal.org? Almost as many people. Who's going to have reviewed a patch on Drupal.org by the end of the week? There should not be anyone with their hands not up at the moment. <laughs> uh, so these you know, guidelines to look for both when writing code and when reviewing someone else's code, whether it's a patch or, you know, do I want to use this module, do I trust this developer? Uh, we're gonna look at seven smells in particular. Um, these are not necessarily, you know, there's not an exhaustive list of kind of red flags, um, nor is it even the normal academic treatments. This is more of a Drupal-centric uh, approach to uh, the, the question of bad code. <clears throat> So our first code smell, first sign that you're doing something wrong, is the word and. By and, I mean code that does multiple things. This is out of Drupal 7. Uh, the Drupal form submit function retrieves, populates, and processes a form. Okay. Um, populating and processing are actually separate functions. Retrieving is not. So you can populate a form without ret retrieving it. Or you, you can't populate a form on its own, but you can't retrieve it without populating it and processing it. What if you just want the form? Then you actually can't, because this function does too much. If a function does something and something, that's a problem, because you don't have it down to one atomic action that you can mix and match. That's kind of obvious. The documentation will tell you that there's a bug, but uh, this is the Solar PHP client. This is the PHP library that pretty much everyone uses to talk to uh, Solar Server. Uh, both the Apache Solar module and the Search API module in Drupal 7 use this client. And you know, there's a, a class in there that is a connection object to Solar, and it has a method on it called add documents, into which you pass an array of document objects. And this says, okay, add these to the index, yeah, add these to Solar. Great, seems like a single action, except in order to do so, you first have to render those objects, those solar objects into XML. Okay, no problem, we've got this handy utility method that does that. What's the problem here? Well, there's two problems. One, document to XML fragment is uh, protected. So if you want to just render a document to XML, you can't. If you want to just render um, you know, the entire payload of the add header and all the other stuff that goes in there that I left out to keep, make it fit on the slide, for debugging purposes, you can't. It is physically impossible with this code to render uh, a series of documents to XML without also sending them to Solar. And of course, if there's a problem with them, Solar will give you back a completely useless error message because it works that way. Um, and this makes debugging impossible. I spent, I don't want to think about how many hours on this problem not that long ago. 
So, and is not always obvious. The correct solution here is to break this up. Document to XML fragment should be public. That's one atomic action. We should have a render documents method. And then all of this function should do is call render documents, get back that string, and then pass that on. So we can break that process up into pieces, each of which does only one thing. In the OO world, the fancy name for this is God objects, uh, which are an object that does more than one thing, that is responsible for connecting to a database and formatting queries, that is responsible for connecting to solar and rendering uh, solar objects, that is responsible for um, you know, saving nodes and being a node, the actual you know, node itself. Um, that's bad because you'd want to be able to separate these actions and use them independently from each other. In particular, uh, is anyone, everyone's familiar with the term composition? I hope. So that's, um, instead of having one huge object or one huge function, you break up the task into a series of smaller objects or functions and then have a wrapper that leverages them. And to the outside world, it looks like a single piece, but it's actually not. That gives you a lot more flexibility by avoiding that word and. <clears throat> Number two, the word or. Notice a pattern emerging. If you have a function that will sometimes do one thing or sometimes do another, and that may vary depending on what's passed into it, may vary depending on time of day, it, no. <laughs> oh, there are way worse examples than that. In fact, all I'm going to show here is the doc block for registry check code. This is the core of the registry in Drupal 7 that tracks um, where classes live on the file system so we can lazy load them, which is a very good feature. It's an absolutely critical feature to have. We're going to do more of that in Drupal 8. But this is how it works right now. Um, so that first parameter is type which is documented very nicely to say this is the type of resource we're looking for, which is either class or interface, or a constant that mess messes around with the cache. Wait, what? And the second parameter is the name of the resource we're looking up, like the name of the class, but sometimes null because it gets ignored if the first one is not a string. And we return, um, um, well, sometimes a constant and sometimes null and sometimes false and yuck. I don't know. There's like three different, func three different operations shoved together into this one function. And so you can't actually predict what's coming out of it unless you know the implementation internals. And that's disgusting. That's a sign that you're definitely not factoring your code out properly. If you find yourself in a situation where a function does A or B, split them up into function A and function B. It's not that hard. But you know, what if you actually need to share data between these two functions? This happens a lot in Drupal. Like, you know, we have this cache of classes we've used on a given page that you want to store so we can auto-load them later. The answer there? Oh, oh, objects, shared data between different operations that are bundled together. Very simple. Here's what the registry should look like. Just very simple, straight port make it a, uh, an object, give it a couple of separate methods. Each method does exactly one thing. Then we just set that up. You know, here's our, our autoloader, register the shutdown function. PHP supports this. It's very simple. And this way, you know exactly what each of those methods is going to do. Each of those methods becomes simpler because all it's doing is taking a simple defined input and, getting a, and returning a simple defined output. It's much easier to document, easier to debug. <clears throat> easier to understand. Uh, and you handle shared data by just having you know, internal properties to the object. Code smell number three. The word if. This is a, an actual quote from a former boss of mine uh, from a number of years ago. Overly complex, complex code leads to overly complex bugs. Now where have we seen that before? So, who here has worked on comment module in core? I see exactly one hand go up, and you're a brave, brave soul. 
So comment node view. I went through and took out everything in this function except the conditionals. This is the structure of this function. This is just Drupal 7 core. Um, what does this function actually do? It's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Oh, now we're, I know we're in trouble. We've got 13 if statements here. And some of those have else's on them. Um, I can't even follow the logic in this code, really. The fancy academic term for this is cyclomatic complexity, which is a measure of the number of independent paths through the source code. Fancy way of saying how much branching happens within this code. How, can we, you know, how many different ways can we get through here to, fi to reach a conclusion? Well, it's not 13, actually, because you could have uh, return if on one of them and something else on another, and some of these are nested inside others. So it's actually probably somewhere around 30 possible code paths. I didn't actually count. There's some fancy algorithm for actually determining it. And God help you if you have a, a for each loop in here someplace with an if statement inside that. And of course, all of this depends on view mode, which is a string, and node, which is an unstructured object with God knows what properties on it. So good luck. Correct solution here, break this thing up. This is way, way too complicated for any sane human being. Uh, you'll, you'll sometimes hear guidelines, especially in academia, of you know, a, your function should be small enough to fit on one screen. That's actually a stupid guideline, but what it's getting at is long and complicated routines should be broken up into smaller, simpler routines. <coughs> you, and that helps eliminate these conditionals. Uh, this is actually an excerpt from the Linux kernel documentation for the uh, coding standards there. The Linux kernel uses eight spaces, or uh, eight tab stops for its uh, indentation. Drupal uses two, the kernel uses eight. Now this causes a problem if your screen is not wide, uh, and therefore, you know, when you get down to the code you're actually looking at, you've got about four characters on the edge of the screen to actually work with before you start scrolling. And Linus Torvalds' answer to this in true Linus Torvalds fashion is, dude, what the hell are you doing with more than three levels of indentation in the first place? Okay, his style may need work, but he's absolutely right. If your code is that complicated and has that many layers of conditionals in it, it's too complicated for a mere mortal to understand. And sorry, you're all mere mortals. So am I. Closely related to this is runtime type identification. Fancy name for uh, you know, essentially hard coding your options for something. Let's say we want to uh, you know, consistently get the label of an entity, which on nodes is stored in the title property, in comments, in the subject property, and so forth. This is fortunately not what Drupal Core does. <clears throat> um, but this, this would be a naive way of doing it, because we have now hard-coded the existence of node, user, and comment into this function. And we cannot support more entities without hacking core. And we all know what happens when you do that. <clears throat> what core actually does is somewhat better if somewhat uglier, this is the actual entity label function in Drupal 7 core. Um, instead, we say, okay, grab the entity information, which is a, from hook entity info, it's a big array, and grab the label callback function out of it and call that function. All right, we get that kind of flexibility that way, and we even get a fallback if one isn't specified. Um, but it's kind of ugly and hard to read, and actually rather slow because of all these, this array handling. Um, better pr approach? Make it a method. Now, when you want to get the label for an entity, <clears throat> it's an object, it has a method, you call it. There is no conditional involved. That if statement, or that switch statement from back here, has been consumed into the language structure itself. It's now a, f a fundamental part of 
the PHP language, polymorphism, uh, which is really just a fancy way of saying uh, objects can change what they are and you don't care. So at that point, we don't even need a utility function. We just call a method and we're done. Simpler, faster, less likely to have bugs. Number four, and I'm actually moving through this very fast. Drupal web test case. Who here has written a unit test for Drupal? I'll bet you money you haven't. Unit testing, very good thing. Absolutely critical for, for good software. Unit testing is the method by which individual units of source code are tested. And a unit is the smallest testable part of an application. That is, you take a piece of code, break it down to the smallest possible self-contained piece, and make sure that piece works in a vacuum. You eliminate the variables around it, eliminate, you know, the proper scientific method, eliminate variables and control just, just this one little piece and make sure it works. Then when you put that piece together with other pieces, it's more likely to, you know, still work. <clears throat> This is an outline of Drupal web test case. Before every test it runs, we generate a complete database instance. We generate a complete language environment. We mess around with the global shutdown functions that registered with PHP. We create a files directory. We change some PHP any settings. We delete a whole bunch of global objects set a bunch of other global objects, install Drupal, which easily takes a minute or two on its own, populate the registry table, install some additional modules that weren't part of the installer, I'm not entirely sure why, <coughs> rebuild all data structures after enabling the module. That comment is actually right out of the function itself, and I'm not entirely sure why we're doing that, to be honest, but then we go and run cron, then we simulate a login, which means we're actually doing a, a post back to ourselves within the web server, so we're making a web request back to ourselves and spinning off separate processes, and then we muck around with variable set, which is global. There's a reason why unit tests take so long to run. Because we're treating Drupal itself as our unit. This is not a unit test. No, this is not a unit test by any stretch of the imagination. This is called system testing, which is conducted on the complete system. This is very good. This is important. System level testing is critical to make sure that your system as a whole works properly. But it tells you absolutely jack about whether or not individual pieces of code are doing what they're supposed to. What it's telling you is that Drupal does what it's supposed to, not that this function or this subsystem, or this object, are doing anything right at all. Just that taken together, their bugs cancel each other out. That's just no, no good. Instead, little known class Drupal unit test case. This creates no fresh Drupal install, just sets up an empty database connection, and gives it off to you. And it's therefore about a thousand times faster, I conservatively estimate. Um, Actually, it, I'm making that number up, to be honest. It takes longer to post back to Drupal the web request to start the test than it does for the test to actually run. It's really that much faster because it's doing so much less because it's not setting up that complete Drupal environment. Code you're testing with Drupal unit test case, you're testing just your code. This is good. This is how you know that you're doing something right, not that Drupal is doing something right. <coughs> And in Drupal 7, the Drupal 7 branch of core right now, um, we have 10 times as many web test cases as we do unit test cases. We don't have unit tests in Drupal. We have system tests. We do not have unit tests. And um, yeah, that's a problem. Because if you cannot unit test it, your code is wrong. I don't know how, but I can't demonstrate that it's right, and neither can you. And if you can't show it's right, then it's wrong until proven otherwise. Judgmental? Yes. But that's how you get good code. Yeah. If you see code that cannot be tested with Drupal uh, unit test case, with a pure unit test, 
that's a smell. That indicates that this code has bits and pieces and dependencies dangling all over the place that you can't keep track of and could change based on God knows what without you knowing about it. How do you make test code that is more unit testable? Step one, avoid globals. Really. And everyone here, is anyone here still using globals in their own code? That's willing to admit it? One person. Okay, two people. Yeah, please stop. If you're using a global, your code is not unit testable. Period. If you're using statics, your code is probably not unit testable. It might be, it depends on the static. But there's a good chance that it's not. By statics, I mean you know, static caching variables or um, the Drupal static function. Drupal static is uh, the bastard love child of globals and statics and has roughly that level of compatibility with unit testing. <clears throat> um, dependency injection, which for those who have not heard me rant about it before, is you know, a given piece of code should not call out to the system to get information it needs. It should be given the information it needs. In the case of an object, that means you pass in other objects to it, and then you can manipulate that data. In the case of a function, it means you pass uh, parameters into the function. Um, very you know, good example there. Who remembers the menu system in Drupal 5? Didn't it suck? Uh, you, know, you had to call arg1 all the time to check and see which node you were dealing with, which meant that you were hard-coded to that path. In Drupal 6, that shifted, so now you pass in a node object. That's dependency injection. It's very simple. <clears throat> and part and parcel of that is avoiding singletons. Singletons are a fancy global. They're something you cannot modify. They're a hard dependency. Every function call is a hard dependency because you have hard code of the name of a function into your code. Which also means deep function stacks. So if you have function A that calls function B, that calls function C, that calls function D, that calls function E, that calls function F, your function A depends on every single one of those and cannot be tested without them. This is a problem. Instead, do what we did, what we did before. Break it up into a series of separate functions and have a wrapper that does nothing but call each of them separately and wire them together. <coughs> or make it an OO and you can do essentially the same thing. It's just a more flexible way of doing it. Number five, documentation. Why is documentation a code smell? Because you can't teach what you don't actually know. And if you can't teach it, you don't actually know it. And if you can't document it, you don't actually know what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, I service certainly don't know what you're doing. Drupal is actually really good in this regard. Drupal core is really good. I had, had to work hard to find a good example here. But uh, this is the file transfer FTP class in Drupal 7. Tell me, what does this jail string do? I don't know. And settings is an array, I know that. But array of what? I haven't a clue. I have no idea how to use this function, or how to use this method. And so I presume that the person who wrote it has no idea either. If you can't document it, you don't actually know what you're doing. The return statement's great. It tells me exactly what I'm getting back and the conditions I'm gonna get it back under. But these parameters, no. <coughs> so this is a bad code smell because it means you either don't know what you're doing or can't figure out what you're doing. And either way, it's too complicated to document, which means it's too complicated, period too complicated to not have bugs. Date module. It's the only part of Contrib I'm going to pick on today. Um, what, op, what is object? Options are what? Name of what? And context. I don't even know what that is. The word context has at least four meanings in Drupal, and I'm sure this is a different one than all of them. There is no useful documentation here 
Therefore, I have no clue what's going on. Therefore, the maintainer of this code has no idea what's going on because two weeks later, that maintainer is the same as me. They, they haven't read it in two weeks. God only knows what's going on here. Lack of documentation is a sign of a probable bug because if it wasn't a bug, it'd be simple enough for you to document. <clears throat> Lack of proper comments is a sign of laziness or that you don't understand what's going on or you're indifferent to it or that the code is so embarrassed, embarrassingly buggy you're afraid to document it. Pro tip, if you're embarrassed about the code, that's a reason to document it to help deflect responsibility. <laughs> Comment down here is he usually just documents his embarrassment. Yeah. Some of the most useful comments I have ever read or written are, here's what we're about to do. It's stupid. Here's why it's stupid and why we have to do it anyway. If you are, find yourself in that situation where you're doing something that doesn't make sense to you, that is an excellent place to document it to show, A, why it's being done so someone else doesn't waste hours and hours on it, and B, to show that other person reading that code that it's not your fault. <clears throat> what should you document? Every single function. Even if it's pr uh, intended to be a private function, every single function should have a complete doc block. Every single method, even if it's private, has a complete doc block. Every class, every property of an object should have a documentation block on it. Every single constant, every parameter to every function and every uh, method. I don't have globals listed on here. Does that mean we shouldn't be documenting our globals? No, it means we should be eliminating them entirely. We already went over that one. <clears throat> so yeah, document, document, document. This is a code smell. This is a sign that your code is bad if you can't document it. And um, there'll be questions at the end, I think. Number six. Inappropriate intimacy. This is a, a code smell where one piece of code knows too much about another piece of code. <clears throat> By knows too much, has too much access to implementation details. This is a form of tight coupling. There's lots of different ways the code can be coupled. So, again, fancy academic term um, that refers to how tightly bound two pieces of code are, how interdependent they are, how likely one is to break another. And the highest form of coupling is when one piece of code depends on implementation details of another piece. Uh, ideally, they're separated so much that there's just this intermediary that's handling traffic back and forth between them. That's not always possible. Um, ideally, you want to deal mostly in data coupling, where you're passing parameters in, so you need to know the API. That's it. Uh, or control coupling. That's where you know one object is just telling another one what to do all the time. That, yeah, that's OK. But dealing with implementation details, or God forbid, shared globals, <coughs> means that you can't change one piece of code without changing another means when you ask what is the knock-on effect of changing its implementation detail, and the answer is, I have no idea. It's probably a 400 line, uh, a 400K patch. I hate writing 400K patches. I hate reviewing 400K patches. But that's what you have to do when you have code that is too tightly coupled. If you want to optimize your code somehow to make it faster, to make it s simpler, how much are you going to break the API? The problem is, if you expose implementation details, those details become part of the API. And then you cannot change them without breaking your API every single version. Do we know any projects that have that problem? Are there any examples in Drupal? Well, this form API, which is, you know, a complete exposed data structure from the get-go, so you can't change any of the properties even in the slightest without breaking every form. There's its uh, stepchild, render API. Hook page alter is based entirely on having access to internal implementation details and modifying those directly, which means 
you can't even change your configuration without breaking your API. Anyone tried to work with the field API? The way language is stored on a field? Yeah, if we try to clean it up for Drupal 8 to make it simpler, we're gonna break that API too. Uh, I apologize in advance. One of our older ones. Um, yeah, hook node load. Nodes are just a bare object, which means if you, in, in, just in your own custom code, add a, a property to a node object and hook node load, and then later on try to, ch to change it because it's you know, faster or easier to load or whatever, you've just broken your API. <sighs> Probably the biggest code smell we have in Drupal is systems are just too interdependent because we expose implementation details. We don't actually have true APIs between different parts of the system. This is an example, you know, just a more concrete example. This is what the select builder, part of the database layer in Drupal 7, would look like with exposed APIs or with exposed data structures. Let's see. First, define your field lists, then your table array, and wait, is it inner join or is it join? Wait, did that change? And wait, when we list stuff in the where clause, are we using the alias of a table or are we using the table name? I'm not actually sure. And yeah, actually, th this inner join, if we wanted to change it from just from inner join to just inner and work, move the word join just as part of the implementation, um, you can't do that without breaking the API on every single query. Fortunately, this is not the API in Drupal 7. This is. Not only is it easier to read because it's better abstracted, but the implementation details are hidden. So we did in fact change whether it was inner join or inner that was stored in that data structure at some point post code freeze in Drupal 7. I don't actually remember which direction we changed it, nor does it matter because that implementation detail is hidden. Modules do not have an intimate knowledge of this query object, nor should they. <clears throat> and you know, therefore, we're able to optimize the code without breaking stuff. Make sure you have provide that same kind of flexibility to uh, people using your code. Best way to do that? Interfaces, interfaces, interfaces. That doesn't have to be object-oriented. If you're doing stuff with object orientation, build an interface and design to that on both sides. Even if you're doing procedural code, though, you have a function, it takes parameters, internally it's a black box, it returns a variable. Period. In what happens inside that function is irrelevant to the caller. If it is relevant to the caller, then the caller has, is now intimately involved with your code and you cannot separate the two. You cannot unit test the two separately, you cannot change the API or the, the details of one of them without changing the API. Another easy trap to fall into, especially in Drupal. Number seven, impurity. Fancy name. <clears throat> a pure function, this is, again, I'm getting to a little bit of academia here, um, is a function or routine where if you give it a given piece of input, you will always get the same output and there will be no side effects. Side effects include I.O. That's writing to disk, printing to the screen, and so forth. <clears throat> the great thing about pure functions is that they are very well behaved. You can unit test them with absolute guarantee that they're gonna work next time. If they work in the unit test, they'll work in the real world. You know if you call them multiple times, nothing's gonna break. <clears throat> you may not get what you want, but they're not gonna break. You're not going to break anything else in the system either. Side effects usually mean changing of state somewhere else. <clears throat> uh, you can generally spot a function that is not pure by side effects. Does a, an object that gets passed into it change? Is there a global that gets changed? Have we written something to disk? Have we printed something to, to the screen? Have we set a variable elsewhere out in a, another utility function someplace? Can we call this function 15 times without causing weird side behavior? If you have any of those, then this function is impure. Now, not all functions have to be pure. 
This is why I don't write in a functional language, a purely functional language, because those are really hard to do state in. And let's face it, we're web developers. Everything we do is about taking, is about I.O. It's sucking data out of a database, writing it to a database. That's all I.O. In that case, the goal is the side effect. The goal is that, you know, we've written something to disk. The goal is we've set some certain property on an object. You know, we've altered a form structure or, or whatever. That's okay. Separate that functionality. Separate the side effect driven functionality from uh, your, your pure functionality. Leverage one from another. That's fine. But you want to be able to reuse that functionality in places you didn't expect. Whether it's a function, a, uh, an object, whatever. You want that flexibility. <clears throat> and if you don't have it, that's a sign that you probably should get it. Good example here, Drupal theme initialize in core. Let's see, we've got three globals, so we're already uh, losing. Uh, one of them is the global user object, which is one of the dumbest ideas we've ever come up with in Drupal. Um, and I don't know what the menu system has to do with it, but we're saying, okay, if we've already been called before just return theme, this does not actually mean there's no side effects necessarily, because we can't guarantee outside of this function if it's been called. Um, and then we are also setting, you're playing around with some statics. We already talked about how those were a problem. And then we're queuing stuff up into JavaScript. This function is extremely impure. Is that okay? I'm gonna venture a guess and say no, because there's no actual I.O. happening here that we care about. What we're doing is initializing a system. Why is that system held in a global? Better approach. Okay, make it an object. You have a theme object that you statically cache in the theme function. It itself does not set anything globally. The theme class here, you know, the constructor contains most of that self-initialization code. The theme function, does, or the theme method then, doesn't have to play around with globals. It's tracking the theme key internally, so it's encapsulated. All the code is right in there in one place. And that object itself does nothing to play around with global JavaScript. We're separating that part out into a separate call. So that theme object is now pure. The theme function, the get.js, actually the theme method, the get.js method, those are all now pure routines. And we can call them 100,000 times without breaking something else somewhere else in our system. And we know that because we know we don't have access to do so. <clears throat> okay, the theme function is still calling Drupal add.js, and we still have to figure out what to do with this global user um, but one patch at a time, please. So this way we've separated out our pure pieces and our impure pieces, and we can now unit test that theme class on its own. All of these tied together. <clears throat> all right. All of these signs of code that sucks. So like, let me actually pause for a moment here. Who, who here recognizes their own code in one of these slides? Yeah, I'm not surprised. All of us ran into this problem at some point. But there are, you know, conversely, there are ways to recognize you're doing something right. And I, I've heard these as good smells. Good smells are kind of the opposite of these bad smells. If you look at a piece of code, is it single purpose? Does it do exactly one thing and do it well? No side effects, no you know, weird, you know, non-repeatable behavior. Does it do one thing and do it well? Is all of the logic for it contained in one place? Or is it scattered around 15 functions and three globals? If your code, you know, if everything for this functionality is in one place, physically and logically, you can fit it in your head at one time, that's a good sign. If you can just wrap your head around this, this one piece in isolation, that's a good sign. If just looking at the code, you can tell what it's going to do because it's not depending on random other pieces of information elsewhere around the system. It's not depending on, you know, what's the state of this global, which might have been altered by this alter hook over here and all, and all that kind of stuff. If you can just look at it and say, aha, I get this passed in, I will get this out. That's a good sign. <clears throat> If you can do it 17 times with the, with the rest of the system changing around you and still get the same result, that's a good sign. If it is well documented so that you can point out 
where that's true, and more importantly, where it's not. And if you have lots of if statements and you have to explain why, if, you have, if you're doing one of these things that normally look wrong, but it's actually the right thing in your situation, document that fact. That's a good smell. When I'm reading code, if I see you know, a block of code that looks horribly ugly, but there's a comment block on it that says, you know, here's what we're doing and here's why, even if it's not blaming someone else, that's a good sign because it means whoever wrote that code thought it through. And they're also telling me what is going on and where those other side effects are going to be. <coughs> that's a good sign. For some more self, shameless uh, self-promotion back in DrupalCon Chicago, I gave a presentation on uh, kind of the converse of this session, which is good API design. Uh, you can check that out. Videos online. Um, there's a couple of other good articles I recommend reading on uh, code smell. These slides will be online, so you don't need to write it down. Um, the first two here are uh, talking about other code smells in a more academic fashion a bit, kind of their, their academic names. Um, <clears throat> the third one here from Jolon Software. It's an interesting proposal to use coding standards to indicate code smells. Uh, the actual example he uses is, you know, you always notice sanitize your variables if they're coming from a user, right? He actually proposes using variable naming conventions as <clears throat> a way to create a code smell for unsafe data. I don't know if I agree with him, but it's an interesting thought. Is there somewhere in Drupal that we can make it easier to recognize when we're doing something stupid? Maybe. It's worth asking. And I, I encourage everyone to subscribe to the Daily WTF. Uh, it's a great research project. Some people think it's a comedy site. It's actually a research project of all the things not to do by example. Um, so far, I have never seen any of my code end up on here. I've never seen any Drupal code end up on here. Uh, I hope never to do so. And I encourage you to make sure we never do so. But it's a great way to see things that you shouldn't do. <coughs> and end of the main session. Uh, we do have a fair bit of time for questions. So if you have questions, just Flag this guy down. I think there was one right over here first. <coughs> Hi. Uh, a few days ago, you tweeted about uh, another code smell about strong arm using strong arm into uh, with the module to code smell. Can you speak about it? Um, yeah. So I think there's a bit of an echo on that microphone. So the, the question was a couple of days ago. I actually tweeted um, about the strong arm module. Uh, which is a Drupal module that lets you tie uh, variables from variable get and variable set into the features module. And <coughs> uh, I tweeted that it's a great way for finding code smells. Not that there's anything wrong with strong arm. I actually have not looked at his code in detail, so I'm not going to say anything about it one way or another. But it lets you look at what modules are doing with the variable table and say, oh, look, this module is writing in five variables for every node type in the system. This module is writing in a variable for every other module in the system. Why? If you see a module that is abusing the variable system, that's a kind of a Drupal-specific uh, code smell. If it's using the variable system for what really should be a dedicated table, that's a code smell. And strong arm, because it gives you a GUI where you're poking through all of the variables that exist in the system so that you can flag them to get written out to disk, is just a, a quick way to check and say, wow, this module over here is writing 117 variables. Why? Really should be somewhere else. So uh, that, that's more what I was going for there. It wasn't a, a slide against strong arm. It's um, a slide against modules that are abusing the variable system. Um, in your list of uh, things that should be documented, I didn't see the file um, all by itself listed. Um, um, some files do uh, declare some document documentation about the, the entire file in the beginning of the file. Is that something that you deliberately left out of that list? Uh, so again, there's a bit of echo. I'm not sure if the recording is going to catch the microphone properly. The question is, should we also document files? Um, Drupal's documentation lead, Jen Hogden, would say yes. Um, personally, I sometimes don't document, you know, put a doc block uh, on a file if the file itself only contains one thing. So if a file just contains one class, then 
you know, the class documentation should be sufficient. Um, if it's a file that contains, like, you know, here's all of the utility functions related to this subject area, then probably yes, you do want a doc block for the file to indicate, um, you know, why a function is in this file and not another file, because it's part of this category. Uh, in Drupal, you know, using the group tag to indicate this function is part of this group, or this class is part of this group in the API documentation is good too, uh, but that's somewhat project specific. Um, but in general, most of these recommendations are not Drupal specific as far as documentation. File, to some extent it depends which developer you ask. Um, I, I will say this, you can, will not get yelled at for having a file doc block. Uh, you might get yelled at for not having one. I've never seen anyone yelled at for actually having one. Other questions? Uh, what approach would you take to not having a global user variable? I'm, sorry, I, I, I'm still getting an echo from the microphone. Shall I speak more slowly? Uh, yeah, please. Okay. What approach would you take instead of having a global user variable? Well, what would I do instead of a global user variable? If you'll forgive me a moment to make a uh, small sales pitch, um, for the Web Services and Context Core Initiative, uh, one of the things we want to do is introduce a, a universal context system into Drupal, which in some sense is a global, but it's a global with very specific controlled properties, and it's through that that you access information like currently active user. And the advantage there is um, because your only access to it is through that uh, controlled environment, that interface, you can't modify a global object for something else. You can't change the active user out from under some other piece of code. You can you know, change it for your scope and children of your scope, but once your scope ends, any changes you've made kind of go away. Um, so that's what I'm trying to replace the global user object with. For more information on that, come to my core conversation session tomorrow. Um, it, I forget the exact time, but all of the Drupal 8 initiative owners are doing a, a status update. I'm giving a brief overview of the Whiskey project there. Uh, and then there's going to be a code sprint on Friday. So if you want to know more about how I plan to kill global user, come to those. I think we've got a couple over here. Are there any plans for removing um, the query builder and making people use start procedures? I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Are there any plans in removing the query builder and using start procedures instead? I'm sorry, the, the microphone is giving a lot of echo. Are there any plans in using start procedures instead of a query builder? Ah, are there any plans for using stored procedures instead of the query builder? I don't have any. Um, in large part because stored procedures in databases are extremely not portable, so we'd have to write those separately for every database we support. Um, however, there was a core conversation this morning uh, by uh, Damien Tourneau, who's one of the database co-maintainers, um, arguing that we should move to a document-oriented storage approach with essentially automated, integrated, materialized views for querying, and that might use stored procedures internally. Um, that's still in very early discussion. I don't know there uh, what, if anything, is going to come of that. Um, but I, I'd say from a from code smell perspective, that's not really a smell one way or another. Um, stored procedures are a database level tool. They've got their good uses and bad uses just like any other. Also, um, are there any plans on um, implementing some code and standards so that we can remove smells from code? Um, are there any plans on standards to remove, to remove smells from core? Coding standards to remove smells from core. Um, I have not proposed any in particular. Um, actually, I, I consider the use of a static, you know, static methods on classes to be a code smell. Not everyone agrees with me on that one, but uh, I do encourage people to uh, deal with objects, not with static objects or static classes. Um, and I believe the documentation standards for Drupal do encourage that. Um, the documentation coding standards are basically exactly what I just said. You know, document everything in detail uh, it, to the best level you can. Um, I'm certainly open to having coding standards that deal with some of these smells. 
Uh, some of them, ag again, they're not necessarily hard rules. There are cases where you do need 17 if statements in something. Um, but I'm definitely open to documenting good guidelines uh, for good code. Uh, if you're interested in working on that, let me know. We can uh, try and get that into the, doc the, into the documentation. Um, before there was a talk, a core conversation talk about uh, Selenium testing, mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> as you said, it's uh, system testing, well, from what I understood. Mm -hmm. What do we have to, or what do, do we plan something to unit test our JavaScript? Because I know there is like a, some JavaScript framework, testing framework like Jasmine or something like this. Unit testing JavaScript. Yes. Um, I believe jQuery has something that it uses, but I've never worked with it. Um, I just, it's an area I don't have much familiarity with, so I can't really say. Um, on the PHP side, almost the entire PHP world has moved over to using PHP unit as their testing framework, except us, of course, um, which is, it focuses on unit testing and code coverage tools. Uh, but on the JavaScript side, I just don't know what the tools are there. Oops. I think, come back. Hi. Um, so uh, one of the, the bad code smells in Drupal, I think, is that we, we don't define which, pub, which functions are public and which are private. Mm -hmm. So I, I sometimes see uh, w whenever WebChick is reviewing a patch for you know, stable Drupal 7, um, she'll be freaking out because uh, you know, function definitions are changing. And we have no system of which functions we can use as API functions we can rely upon and which functions might change in the future. So I think we need to uh, have a, a much stronger definition of which functions are API functions and which functions are, are private. I would agree. Um, and actually, a fair part of that, I think, is moving over to uh, OO and having real protected methods, in part because as long as you have these kind of pseudo-private functions, just a normal function with an underscore, you're still going to treat that as an API, even if you shouldn't. And that goes to the developer, too. They're just you know, writing along, writing code, and thinking, OK, oh, if I need to do this, I can just use this internal function. I think and we, that we becomes could. an excuse to not write a better API and think through, OK, what do I really need to use here, and thinking through that interface. Um, so I, I agree. Interface-driven development does not imply object-oriented development. It just helps. If, if we mark functions as public or private in, in, in the Doxygen, then we could actually have a test that would um, point out, oh, you're not allowed to call this function, um, don't do it, so the test would fail. Having a unit test that tests that you don't call a certain function, a uh, private function, you cannot actually do in PHP unless you're using RunKit. Um, RunKit, for those not familiar with it, is a PHP plugin that lets you change the nature of the language uh, out from under you. It's uh, a very, very dangerous program uh, module. Um, I don't use it myself. But that's the only way to do something like, uh, you know, make sure this function is not called. Um, I'm not sure that that's something we can unit test for, but that would be something that we could document as a convention of, you know, if the doc block for this function has, you know, at private on it or something like that, then it's allowed to change between Drupal versions. And if you try to call it directly, it's your own fault. But at the same time, we have to also culturally say, if there's something that I cannot do without calling that private function, then that is a critical bug in the API and should be fixed. And even if that means adding functions in, you know, within a stable line, like in you know, 7H, 7, 7, uh, that, that would have to come as a match set, I think. Thanks. I think we've got time for like, two or three more questions. So do you think that we can use the coder module at the moment to detect um, code smell, and what can we do to improve the coder module to do it better? Uh, coder module is essentially a, uh, a giant pile of regexes. So if we can write a regex that can detect some of these smells, then probably we can use that as a, a, a smell test, no pun intended. Um, probably it'd be something like, you know, check for, um, you know, check doc blocks. If a doc block doesn't have a description under a, prop, a parameter, flag that. If um, a doc block doesn't have, you know, its parameter list doesn't match up to the function, flag that. If um, you, 
you probably could write one that checks a, uh, a function or a method and says, if there are more than five if statements, flag that. That may or may not be useful. Most of these require a human to actually analyze if it's real, but certainly you could have a, you know, check for bad signs tool. There are actually such tools in other languages. Uh, I believe there's one for Java. Uh, someone said one over here. What's that? Mm -hmm. Protritic? Perl Critic? Okay, apparently Perl has one called Critic. Um, I don't know of any offhand for PHP, but I have no problem with us writing one. What's that? PHP Code Sniffer. You're right, there is one. Let's use it. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, hang on, he's coming with a microphone so that we can record it. Hi, sorry. Um, Larry, I notice on your website that you specify that you're a, a Zen certified engineer. Mm -hmm. and wondered if that would be a recommendation you'd make to anyone to help with our continued professional development, make our code better, and that sort of thing. I, I speak up. I I heard the first part of that. I'm a Zen certified the, engineer and... Uh, your certified Zen engineer mm -hmm. and wondered if that was, would be in any way useful for our continued professional development and improvement for uh, Drupal code generally. Um, all right, Zen certification, um, I don't think they're sponsoring this conference so I'm okay with saying this. It tests your knowledge of the breadth of PHP, not your knowledge as an actual good developer. Uh, it tests how well you can memorize the PHP manual. Um, I'm not sure I'd recommend anyone get Zen certified. I would recommend reading through the Zen certifications um, study guide because that is a good introduction to parts of the PHP language that you probably have not seen before, but that Drupal has started to use more of. Um, but yeah, as someone who is Zen certified, I don't place a great deal of value in it. Um, honest statement there. Okay, and I think it's 3.15, this will about end, so thank you all for coming.